perfect. Thank you. Um, this gentleman standing next to me looking like a rock star is Dr. Keith Clement. And he's a rock star in real life. He's been uh, directing the California Cybersecurity Task Force Subcommittee on Education. And uh, I'm honored to have him here. And he's going to uh, make sure that uh, this presentation goes accurately. <laughs> Good afternoon or good morning. Um, how is everyone doing today? And thank you very much, Myron. I know that we've worked together for quite a few years, uh, probably back to 2013 on this uh, cybersecurity career education pipeline pathway project. And it's nice to see things move from the design phase to the development phase. Yeah, and it's about time, but everything takes time in the academic world. And it in the business world as well, I guess. I think we did. I, I think we did it wrong. I think that. I think that um, waiting until later in the process to bring industry on board, education initiatives is always, always a troublesome deal. That being said, it's also difficult for industry to sometimes see what education is up to and where they're going. So I, I, I don't know whether you want to build the education partnerships first or the industry partnerships first and then combine everybody. But I think that's really been an interesting component of all of it. Yeah, and that's something that everybody needs to take notes on because building these career pathways and um, having courses in the schools from K-12 all the way up to um, even PhDs is critical because um, otherwise nobody really takes this stuff seriously. Uh, agreed. I think that I think that one of the key obstacles, I'm a very positive, perennial, optimistic fellow, but I, I think that one of the barriers and limitations has been um, getting full engagement from the government side, the the industry side and the education, higher education side. There are so many moving parts there. It really seems to be more about coordination these days and partnerships than um, you know previous models of academics or traditional workforce models would suggest. Right, and uh, really uh, because we are all connected to the same internet if one person is not practicing um, cybersecurity or as we like to call it cyber hygiene um, it puts all of us at risk so educating the public educating potential um, workers down the line something that uh, is a major part of achieving some kind of cybersecurity so um, getting started here Let's wait for it to res a little bit. <laughs> well, that's resing for me anyway. Yeah, doesn't the cyber hygiene just roll off the tongue? And it's easy to understand because um, just like you wouldn't want somebody to make a salad for you if they've never washed their hands, why would you ever want anybody hooking up to the same network as you if they've never run any kind of malware? Uh, protection. Anyway, um, here's a message on the board from Keith uh, that he put together, and it's uh, pretty uh, straightforward. We're trying to uh, make sure that uh, we have collaborative partnerships. You know, we need to meet industry and professional committees, communities rather and assist and support the accreditation movement. You know, um, Keith, do you have anything more to add to that? I, so let's take in a step back. Okay. Educa education institutions tend to be very traditional and resistive of innovation types of practices. 
So when we talk about a cyber hygiene or we talk about um, IT and cybersecurity or comp sci based education, what we know is that we need to start the education process as early as possible. And I think that's been really one of the difficult components of contemporary cyber education is how do we increase the literacy of, of the younger kids in school well before they get onto the job market, which is what many you know career pipelines tend to focus on. And, and so I think that is really one of the key issues is how do we project this early into the process and thus as they get older, and again, I mean this in a transformative societal sense, that as the collective skills of all of us improve through digital education and cyber hygiene and, 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 and these little things that, that many of us are just now coming into grasp with, that I think that's when the time would be right to really types of career pipelines and pathways. Right. And uh, as somehow this slide jumped, but uh, it's probably a good place for it. You know, there is a danger shortage of cybersecurity professionals. And uh, while there's been some um, certification training in the, you know, the uh, community colleges and the high schools, there really hasn't been much else. And to be honest, before people can get into those certifications, they really have to have um, an understanding of what cybersecurity is and why it's important. So getting these courses down to the K-12, kindergarten through 12th grade, and then into the, you know, community colleges and the four-year colleges is something that uh, is going to be really important when we start trying to fill these job vacancies. Uh, agreed. I I like to think of a career pipeline as the way my English teacher taught me how to write. And that is that each paragraph or each level of education must shake hands with the ed, with the programs that came before it and after it. So we talk to the middle schools. What is the tie to the elementary school? What is the tie to the high school? We look at the high schools. What is their alignment to the middle school and to the community college or so-called two-year schools? And what is the two-year school alignment to K-12 to education and the four-year school? And then for most of the folks, by that time, they will have reached their entry point into the workforce with the understanding that some are going to need master's degrees or doctoral degrees, for example, professors of criminal or uh, computer science or... Right. And, um, you know, it's really not just about filling job vacancies, although that is critical in our society today. But uh, just having the general user knowing a little more intelligently how to use the system without getting to trouble is um, something that's been lacking in in our society and altogether. I mean, people still click on links that they know basically at, at heart that um, nobody's going to put a million dollars in their email account or their bank account, you know. <laughs> uh, the, the Nigerian oil minister's widow is not going to send you money. <laughs> and no, you don't give out your Social Security, but you talk to law enforcement and those things still constantly happen. So aside from filling jobs, training our society is something that we've been lacking there, there's some interesting stuff going on currently in the chat right now about yeah. the the difficulty or perceived difficulty of getting students interested in technology and i think one of the things that we're trying to do here in california is set up a soft start program so like for example i had not been on second life for a couple of years and navigating around for the first time you know it could have could have been more easier easier whatever i could have paid more attention to the instructions right. whatever but 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 the issue here is that so many folks get dropped into a comp sci course or whatever whatever the tech component happens to be and they they don't have a soft start into it they 
We, we really need to start earlier and earlier at, a, at an age-appropriate level, slowly bringing them up to speed in, an, in earlier, earlier years. For example, just going to the Word and the Microsoft Office products, I mean, who yeah. would have, when I was in high school, we never ever thought how important it would have been to actually pay attention to that class. Whereas right. in 2020, you don't pay attention to your Excel class, you're doomed. So I, I think that, that what we're trying to do is find a soft start so that kids younger and younger feel more comfortable with the technology and then they can use their own creativity and interests to branch out into the specific areas of their interest and focus. Right. And, um, you know, one of the things Virtual Worlds has taught me is how um, – rich and um, varied the user experience really can be and uh, it's also highlighted something that uh, I tended to take for granted while I was learning and studying cybersecurity myself and the importance of that importance is of uh, social engineering or psychology uh, being in a virtual world suddenly makes it very very clear that that is probably the root of all evil <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I, I think that that's a perfect example of the value of gamification and social experiment as hooks or ways right. to get our students into this earlier and earlier. And I think those are perfect examples of two of the seemingly solid pathways. I think cyber competitions is another solid pathway, but I think those yeah. are two groups of students that really seem to accelerate their learning and do well in this area. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. And um, I'm hoping that other states, other nations are probably getting involved and in trying to get this, these pathways built up. But California has been taking the lead on this, and I'm really glad that there's somebody who's got an example coming on. You know, uh, like this slide says, workforce development, education doesn't really change fast enough. Um, I know in my own experience with working with industry that a lot of times the administrators don't necessarily know what they need in terms of cybersecurity. And in some cases, they simply don't want to own um, making a, a mistake. So uh, that's a challenge in developing all of this. Uh, but it is vital that we develop a worldwide strategy to train workers. And, um, you know, the, the cybersecurity issues are growing and they're going to become more and more challenging. So I'm a candid and a direct fellow, and so I apologize if some folks don't like what I'm about to say in about 30 seconds or three. <laughs> that is that we, I understand the value of competencies. I understand the value of skills. I, I understand knowledge, skills, ability. I understand all that stuff. The fact of the matter is that the current employer right now in 2020 is looking for a four-year degree in something related to uh, IT or computer science or business systems or software, whatever. W right. Degree is unimportant as long as it's technology related. So between 65 to 70 percent of employers for cybersecurity positions and information security positions, it's a little higher in that field, 65 to 70 percent bachelor's degree of some type and right. and or some areas like California will allow you to substitute some years of uh, experience for education. So you could have a two or two year degree in a couple of years and get the job that way. And so the career pipeline really needs to incorporate all of the bullets onto this into a career pipeline that for many folks is going to end at a four year degree plus a few industry certifications that they're going to hook up with in the process of, of education, some at the community college, some at a four-year school, and tech. Some folks are probably getting these certificates in middle and high schools now as well. But in any case, the, the real focus here, Dark Eagle, is on model curriculum and academic standards. And right. that is 
that we we have a standardized yet flexible curriculum and standards that is directed at all of the levels of education that we're talking about here in california it goes back to the about the seventh grade with what we call career technical education and um ooh, new slide <laughs> I hope I didn't change it too fast. No, um, no, I no. So I think that what we're trying to say is that all of the things that you see on the slide are examples of things that we need to incorporate into oops, into a again. career pipeline. Right. Somebody must have clicked on it. I haven't locked this uh, presentation board down, so it changes when anybody clicks on it. <laughs> But anyway, um, a lot of the things you've talked about haven't existed, and some still don't. Uh, there are very few four-year degrees nationwide in cybersecurity itself, and uh, we desperately need those because, as you said, industry expects those. So inclusivity and diversity had long been a concern in, in tech fields. And what we see in inclusivity and diversity is a couple of things. I, I think that a general pipeline exists that we would consider to some degree inclusive and diversive. Right. However, I think that the problem is now one of retention. So, right, we're, we're trying to get, we're trying to get people to work in these areas and then we want them to stay working in these areas. And I think that we need to be developing strategies both to align folks into and having the proper skills to get the jobs and also a supportive environment that keeps people on the job long term, or if not on that specific job, at least within the field. So right. there's nothing wrong with going to a better job at a, you know, nicer office up and down the street. <laughs> no, and uh, this is almost as much a PR problem, you know, public relations, as it is uh, a challenge to actually get these people in there. Um, many, especially minorities, if they don't see a role model there, they've learned over the decades really or maybe even centuries that they don't belong there so we need to not only get people into these positions but show them off a little bit and make sure that um, you know potential um, workers in these fields see that they do belong best best practices here is that um, peer mentoring is best done with representative groups. So, right. and also mentoring is often best done in small groups as well as one-on-one -on -one types of, of mentoring. Um, but I, I want to go. But I want to go back to that this, that slide because it was talking about soft start. And yeah. what's important is that there are many. There are many diverse communities that are what we call first generation learners in the education system, but they're also first generation tech people. Like my dad was an intro computer programmer from the late 60s on. So, you know, if I ever had a tech question or a computer need, I was pretty well covered growing up. But for Me lots too. of folks that exactly, but for lots of folks that do not have the education system background, they don't have somebody they can go to when they're having a problem in their math class, and they have the additional limitation of no tech to speak of in the family, or you know they can't go to the uncle to talk about these things, how to get a job in the field, for example, that we really do need a soft start program so that these introductory novel students actually feel welcome in the field, first of all, but second, and this is critical, they need to know that they can be successful in this area too, and not yeah. just the not just the student, but their family as well. It's their families that are going to be able to tell them, 
you know, the kid says, I'm having a hard time in my cyber or my computer science class. The parent might not have ever taken that class themselves. What they know to say is, hey, it's, you know, you'll do just fine. We know you got this. Uh, we're behind you here. And, you know, that's all the support many people need to just be successful. True. And as far as learning how to do these things, uh, you know, there are so many resources online already. The big challenge is getting people directed to the resources and frankly making sure they actually have access to online uh, because about a quarter of Americans do not. Mm. I imagine that's probably true across the world. So I, I think that you're right. And, and I think that there's three areas that the California Cybersecurity Education Clearing House is of value. The first is it serves as educational and instructor stuff. Right. And then secondly, it includes worker and employers and industry. I mean, that's how you could set up the, the mentoring network that you were talking about. That's where you could have a variety of resources and links embedded. And then third, I think that we could have the diversity and inclusion piece in it as well. Um, resources dedicated to uh, specific populations that have not seen success either in the workplace necessarily or at tech workplaces specifically. And I would also like to include, I mean, uh, not only representation of women and uh, historically underrepresented groups, but also the key inclusion of veterans, disabled veterans, uh, military transitioning to civilian life. Uh, you know, there are millions and millions of folks all across the world and in, in California, for example, that um, they, they could all, they, they know what they want to do. They just don't know the specific steps to get there. And I think all that information would be bet embedded on this clearinghouse. So your high school guidance counselor or your middle school guidance counselor could say when a kid sits down in their office and wants a job in cybersecurity, they'd say, huh, I wonder how you do that. And they pull it up on the computer and they show the screen to the kid and it says step one do this step two right then you're doing that step three talk to these people step four here's the link i mean etc cetera, etc cetera. yeah cookbook you know and uh it's never made a lot of sense to me especially um when we're talking about filling jobs why we try to exclude literally 50 percent of the population women from even getting into these you know careers um, that's just in insane to me. So you're definitely right that we do have to have this inclusivity and this diversity, and it's a key element in everything we're doing here. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm looking at the chat. I'm looking at the chat in, in all of this, and uh, the, the need for diversity and inclusion is is key not not just so that we check the boxes mind you right not not, right. not just so that the 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 hr paperwork is you know sufficiently diverse and inclusive but it, it needs to be deeper than that that we need to find you know the, you know that's one thing about tech isn't it it is not just a job it, it's a it is a lifestyle it is an attitude it is a culture and and those are the things that are auxiliary to the job at hand, but we need to support folks in all of those related endeavors. That's why, for example, we're very supportive of cyber competitions, very supportive of extracurricular activities. We want kids to be spending summers and after schools in these kinds of programs. And let's be honest, they have to be open and available to everybody. And this is one reason why the broadband discussion that's going on worldwide is of concern, because right. there are many areas of which about a third of the kids do not have access to the high speed networks necessary for academic success. And that area goes up and it goes down, but it tends to really be high in inner city 
urban areas and out in remote, isolated countryside locations. So there is a urban and a rural component to lack of broadband access, equity and equality. Yeah, I hope 5G will help. But, you know, when I was working in the school systems, I had one school where the kids lived literally a half hour away from Internet access, yet their homework consistently required them to use uh, the, uh, the network Internet to get information to do their homework. So they would literally go home from school, a half hour bus ride, have dinner, and their parents would drive them back into Paradise, California, which burned down. Right. And uh, then they could do their homework at a wireless cafe somewhere. You know, total insanity. We finally got a wireless access point for them in uh, Sterling City where they lived and made a world of difference. Amazing how that helped them. I appreciate a comment from Shiloh E. talking about... Uh, uh, Indian reservations and sovereign tribal nations and the difficulty of areas like the res in terms of having access to, you know, not only, you know, let's not, let's not even talk about broadband and that basic access. They just don't have access to the instructors and educators that they need. They don't have, you know, how many large tech companies are adjoining reservation land that spends a lot of time on workforce development in that community. Um, I'll, I'll wait and look into the chat for, you know, anything to come up because that's an example of a very underserved community in, in all of this. But again, we're trying to make things better for everybody. And, and I think that one of the ways that we do this, uh, looking at the slide, I think we jumped a slide, but. Um, oh Yeah. <laughs> But it goes back to this pipeline that is virtualized and available to most, right, again, because we already said about 30% of students don't have access to the Internet that they need to to get the job done. So, I mean, we're trying to be as inclusive of, of everybody that we can, and until we figure out broadband and access for all, there's still going to be only certain populations that we're going to be able to, to deal with. But, but we're talking about standards at all levels of education, again, that shake hands with the education programs before and after them. And of course, linked in all this, we have the cyber hygiene awareness. I saw an earlier comment about a lack of labs. And when we talk about education programs, we mean that there are adjoining labs to them. So it's not, it's not just the classroom side of things, but in a very hands-on field such as this, where you have to like, like do things, right? That we wanna see a lot of hands-on specialized training. So we're talking programs with linked labs. We're appropriate, you know, I, there's plenty of content that doesn't need a lab to it, for example. Like the history of, that I think I saw from Vic, um, I believe earlier. Um, and of course, the linkage of all this across levels of education. So the high schooler transitions easily to the two-year school, the community college student translates easily into the four-year school, or, or wherever their job is, right? This is not all about education, and it's not all about careers and workforce. It's how you combine the two in a way that makes sense and is achievable, and attainable by folks that are interested in these fields. And if they don't know that they want to be interested in the field, that's on us. That, that, that's an example of if folks I've seen in the thread, how can I help or what can we do to help? I think that's a perfect example of, of being able to help right there in your own communities and getting folks excited about these. And as educators, for educators here, once they get to us at the education level, it's our job as stewards to bring them through the process, shepherd them through a education program that links and aligns with their career dreams and aspirations. And then we support them in doing whatever education or workforce is necessary for them to get the job. 
Oh, yeah, I, I totally agree. And there are so many antidotes that come to mind on this. But, uh, you know, moving along, one of the things we're doing with all of this is we want to set up a system where graduates can actually dis demonstrate that they have the required abilities, you know, that there are standards at all levels of the education to support a, a vertical track of training and back to cyber hygiene, you know, all of this. If, even if it doesn't lead somebody to a career, they need to have a greater awareness of how they affect the overall, I guess, climate is a good word for it, of um, the network security. Agreed. Okay, I'm going to move on to the next slide here. This one kind of covers, you know, um, the basics of what we're actually doing. This is the, the practical side of it. Um, a lot, I mean, this slide is kind of de deceptive because it really doesn't uh, talk about all the work that's gone on in the background, getting model curriculum together, uh, working with industry and different uh, government organizations to actually try to get the schools to adopt these uh, courses. And of course, budgeting is critical to get teachers. So we have to have professional development for those who want to get involved, but really have the skills yet to teach these courses. Um, getting these things into the graduate programs and faculty research and treat. Uh, this is a lot of work that's been going on behind the, a lot of people aren't aware. Literally, it's the reason why it's taken so long even get to this step so you're gonna you're gonna have to hold me back here for a second i hope y'all are sitting down and or have a, a frothy cup of coffee or ice cold libation depending on your time zone because this really is the bottom line this th this slide right here encapsulates it all so first bullet point k-12 to cyber education programs so we're talking first education programs these education programs are made out of courses that align in various ways to certificate and other kinds of education programs. These courses are made up of cutting edge curriculum, which means that they're cutting edge today, yet they also retain flexibility so that every academic year we can go back and review the curriculum to make sure that it's in line or up, up to date that really is one of the problems that education has, is that t there are so many advances in innovation and technology. And let me be clear, the curriculum process at most university systems is gonna take you a couple years. And that's after it's developed, mind you, not, not counting, th that's the bureaucratic and administrative processes. It takes years to get curriculum done. Well, in any case, how fast does innovation change you know, by the time I said that comment, there's a bunch of obsolete technology. So the curriculum must be up to date and it must be kept up to date and curriculum, extracurriculum activities are essential. You just can't do what we're talking about here in the classroom necessarily in a lecture. They need to be aligned to a variety of extracurricular activities that drive the interest of the younger generations. You know, the stuff that sounds fun to me doesn't sound fun to uh, people that are younger, just like, just vice versa, right? It's so like music and these, these kinds of things. They change over time. So we need to make sure that over time they change to reflect the current interests of folks. So when we were talking earlier about having challenges getting younger people and students into cyber and IT programs, actually it's the extracurricular pathway that's probably the most likely way to do it because it's fun, right? It's fun and then they find out they're learning. And by that time, it's already hook, line and sinker and they're there. But second, the second bullet here, uh, let's see here. Um, there's some chat here that's related, like a club, you bet. Uh, hackathons, capture the flags, bug bounties, having the, the the fellows from the or gals from the local tech company go and show off some some fun things. Uh, you know, get hooked up with various 
communities, uh, have some fun webinars, right? There's go to online museums. I mean, I, I could talk all day about the types of extracurriculars that would go on to here. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Shiloh E. That's exactly what we're talking about. Um, yeah. But in any case, the two year. So we need two year, four year degree programs. Because, as earlier stipulated, 65 to 70 percent of current employers require that. Not to say that that's always going to be the case, and that those numbers are coming down. And many employers do recognize skills and certifications, not degrees in some theoretical science. So I, I get that. But having two year, four year degrees that are available and graduate programs, Dark Eagle, I want to talk just the briefest about that. The, the idea of graduate programs is not because entry-level jobs in IT and cybersecurity require master's degrees, but there are plenty of management jobs that do, and, right. and we need to be thinking of the whole talent model here, right? I mean, not everybody's going to go work in a sock, right? There, there's, there's legislative stuff. There's, you know, uh, philanthropical interests here. There's educators in this space big, small, medium company, all these kinds of things. We need graduate programs so that we can teach and develop a infrastructure and capability to teach IT and cybersecurity in our schools, which means that we're using these graduate programs to educate new instructors for K to 12 that are comfortable in these tech fields, and also a new generation of instructors and professors that will be turning out four-year graduate, two-year graduates in engineering, IT, cyber, business, information systems, etc. Right. And then, you know, the real world faculty research um, has literally been how we've developed a lot of these programs and learning what our vulnerabilities really are in cybersecurity really does depend on investigation and research that can almost only be done in a curriculum, in a academic setting. I mean, it's been that way for years and years. You're correct. And actually, Shiloh E just mentioned a, a point in the chat just a second ago that I, I want to go back to and reemphasize okay. that we don't, we're not only talking about some hard STEM or STEAM, right, to include the arts STEAM programs. We're not just including tech degree programs, Bachelor of Science in Cyber is one, but there's a second degree program that we're working on called a dual baccalaureate degree program in cybersecurity that is actually just a six core sequence of an interdisciplinary nature that is intended to serve as a double major for, all, for um, majors all across a university campus. So for example, a English major or an anthropology major, one of the heavy critical thinking and superior communication based majors linked up with a more technical base that you didn't hear me use the word math, but a more technical base. And that program um, is actually linked to a 2000 hour on the job apprenticeship requirement, OJT on the job training. So the student would basically graduate college with a two-year degree, or I'm sorry, a four-year degree in a double major, with the second major being in a technical field. It will be a technical couple of classes, don't get me wrong, with a soft start to the program, right? So we don't just drop somebody into the middle of some hard program. You know, we, we there's a soft start to get them to that program. Like, for example, one thing of uh, that's difficult in the tech or outside of the tech fields is keeping up on all the acronyms and VPNs and you know all, all, all these ac ASTs and you know uh, all that so IP. You know, we really gotta get people up to speed on that terminology before we start really expecting anything out of them, right? I mean. And, if they're having to go back to their, their dictionary to find out what all these terms mean, we, we got to do a better job on a soft start. Yeah, I agree. You know, one of my favorite lines from one of the uh, Transformer movies was the guy saying, okay, now keep up with the acronyms as he's heading into a 
another disaster. And, you know, it's pretty true. It's a whole new language, and we need to teach that language. See, I think we covered most of this on this slide here about professional development. Apprenticeships are important. I know you've done a lot of work on that and still, along with internships. We haven't talked a lot about project management yet, but that's mm. another critical critical aspect of cybersecurity that people don't necessarily look at. <laughs> I'm just reading Kuta. Keep up with the acronyms. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. What, what does LOL mean? I'm, I'm not at uh, <laughs> LOL. Well, what's that? So, so in talking to industry and and government employers, about 95 percent of current cyber jobs are found in the private sector. About one in five are found for government or quasi government based agencies. But across 100 percent of all of them, they are seeking as part of the education training process, excellent exposure to what they call project management. And right. basically what we mean by that is the ability to start, follow through and complete a project from start to finish, including say the grant writing and the grant management side, all the way to how you actually implement and, and do the project and how you assess and evaluate your success of the project. And w what they want is somebody that is comfortable across all aspects of the project management process. So that's what, that's what you tend to hear from IT cyber employers, what they mean when they're seeking, seeking a project management person. Right. And project management has been growing in uh and how critical it is over the past decade, really. And it's kind of bled over into a lot of different fields, including sales, for example. So it's no surprise that it's critical here in cybersecurity, but uh, it does make it challenging to train people because project management is a, a whole field to study in and of itself. It is, it is. Um, I, I do have a quick comment about bullet number two. We've already spoken about diversity and, and right. inclusivity. When we were first working on this project, and, and, and if I don't get the terms right, or I'm not, I'm, I'm just, I'm candid. I'm not trying to be, you know, difficult. Of course. When we, when we were first thinking diversity and inclusivity strategies in IT and cybersecurity, we actually included strategies directed at just the, the general diversity side of the house. And instead what's emerged is that there is a need for strategies that are in some part different and in other parts the same across groups. So for example, we need, there are strategies that are directed to enhancing recruitment retention for women, for um, folks from ethnic and racial minorities, and for the vet, military vet. Not say that they don't cross over multiple pathways. A lot of them cover some of the same things, but they also differ in some profound ways as well. So I want to say that over time, we actually separated. I don't know if the next slide talks about the, um, yes, it, it, that the next slide cut, cuts into this as well, if you just want to go to that. Um, okay. We seek strategies to enhance participation of underrepresented historical backgrounds. And the, the challenges are similar, but somewhat different. And the strategies to deal with special population groups, this is the rest. So we, so we have strategies for women in tech, cybersecurity tech, and mm -hmm. also for under, underrepresented groups and then, of course, we give back to the recommendations to cyber hygiene. This covers everybody that uses the Internet, which is, you know, everybody that uses a computer across the world is 80 or 90 percent, if I saw that rate not too long ago. Right. Um, yeah, and it's bears repeating, you know, that we're all hooked up to the same Internet, whether we realize it or not. And if one of us is some, doing something stupid, it makes us all more vulnerable. Sad but true. Yeah. Let's see. 
forget what this light is. Oh, yeah. It's very timely. You know, yeah, it is. We really do need these centers, and uh, you might want to kind of talk about what they actually are. So, in as a bit of background here, we have threats and vulnerabilities and the need for intelligence and information sharing, particularly as COVID-19 pandemic has really ushered in a new era of attacks against education institutions. So pre-COVID-19, this is some pretty important stuff. Post-COVID-19, it's you know been critical. For example, many of our education institutions are heavily involved in extraordinarily sensitive research of the life-saving nature. And uh, they've had at least three events, if not breaches. I can't go into the details of those, but uh, wasn't it Michigan State had a recent issue? The um, UC Santa, San Francisco had one. And I believe that the Louisiana and the Texas school districts, respectively, have all had issues, whether RAL, malware, ransomware, you know, the threat right. vectors and attack services are numerous. Well, in any case, what needs to happen is information sharing across educational institutions in much the same way as we see um, what they call fusion centers. And a fusion right. center, it combines law enforcement intelligence with the more intelligence-based information. And they, 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 they hook up to discover and look into what we would call credible threats or you know weird patterns of usage those types of things. So it would involve, of course, um, government and agency, private agencies, private sector, and educational institutions at all levels. And yeah, I do, I do see a lot of, I do see a lot of folks hearing about ransomware and, right. You know, it, it's it's at not just schools, but this would be a place that we could give and share actionable threat information to education institutions and help them out. Right. So we don't all have to solve the same problem independently over and over again when we can just share the solutions as they developed. So in, in for example, in the state of California, we have the California Cybersecurity Integration Center or the Cal CSIC. And right. that would be an example of they, they have a variety of feeds coming into, coming across their stacks and they they can take a look at the general and if they noted any issues or potential concerns they would have a point of contact at all these institutions that they would be able to reach out to and that would be a perfect example of a threat assessment center or attack as it relates to the california csic See what's on this slide now. I forget. I think it's the pathways slide. Yeah, it's just pretty much a, kind of an overview of what is being done in California. You have the K-12 associates degrees and certificates, which actually kind of goes back down to K-12 as well, because certificates are starting to be earned in the high school levels. In some cases, even middle school. Bachelor's degree and graduate programs, we've got to have them. Uh, professional certifications. You know, what's, what I've seen is that a lot of industries are developing their own custom certifications. And we haven't really talked about badging, but I think that kind of falls in there as well. And the big one is on-the-job training because everybody's industry, everybody's job is going to be different. They have to know the basics, but each job is uh, unique. I I would like to spend a moment and talk about professional certifications. Go ahead. <laughs> so many of us are on a variety of social media platforms, maybe Facebook or LinkedIn or Instagram, I guess. And uh, maybe a couple of MySpace folks here too, you never know. And I often see the question, I'm interested in getting into IT, I'm interested in getting into cybersecurity, 
what certifications do I need to have to get the job? Or, or what degree do I need to have? I basically don't know what I'm doing. I want to get into the field. How do I do that? And let me tell you, the amount of uh, discussion about a proper certification path is an example of a great service that we could do to our students and potential workforce is we need to do a better job and and this is on us these are our certifications we're talking about we need to do a better job of letting folks know how to navigate the professional certification morass and i mean that as a morass i hear from so many um, potential students who are afraid to take certifications because they're they have test anxiety for example so if you want to encourage people to get out and do some professional certification we as an industry need to do a better job of reducing things like test anxiety on individuals i can personally tell you the number of folks i've seen or know that have taken all of these courses a plus whatever it doesn't matter they take them to class on campus never sat for the exam ever never thought it never even intended to do so and that's that's an example yeah deep deep breathing to combat anxiety you bet you bet yeah, yeah while well, i was teaching cybersecurity in uh, at butte college one of the things i always included were tests um preparation one of the things i always found out is how few people even understood how to take a test, especially multiple choice tests. There are ways to increase your chances of getting a, a good guess in there, getting it, getting it right. But the main thing is not being panicked. I, um, it, it, is, it is obviously more, I would file test anxiety and these issues as under how we could be more supportive as an right. industry to, to help people get into it you know if, if if there were some really easy tracks and I, I i know some people might have the term objection to the word easy but we we need to be able to appeal to folks to get into this field and we do so by by beginner introductory we were all noobs at one time oh, yeah. and, and and we might be grizzled veterans now and, and not very patient sometimes but we really need to think of how do we get people onboarded into this field in a general sense. And if we're going to rely on education programs and professional certification programs, we got to find better ways to blend those education programs and professional certifications. And we need to find a better way to, to soft start and onboard people into this field. Oh, I totally agree. And I think everybody else does too. So. Semi, I see. I see. Semi grizzled, totally grizzled. If you could see, <laughs> if you could see my, you know, very white beard. I'm a pretty young fellow. Pretty, pretty grizzled over here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm old and senile, but don't tell me. <laughs> yeah, and this kind of goes back to, um, you know, the on the job training side of things that that we tend to all pay lip service to but are incredibly difficult to get set up you know apprenticeships they're they're growing in popularity there's a lot of issues that people are concerned about for example some businesses still try to use them to get free labor um, same with internships but in reality they serve a huge purpose in getting people trained Cyber competitions are fantastic ways, uh, cyber patriots and others, of getting people interested, not only interested, but get them actually hands-on learning in uh, practical situations. And then we have to, we really have to examine the selection hiring process. Uh, I can tell you there are a lot of uh, HR groups that really don't know what a cybersecurity professional is. They Google it, and they get all kinds of stuff. So when they send out their job uh, requests, whatever you call them, they have things in there like, you know, has to be a Microsoft certified systems engineer and 
maybe a CCSIP and God knows what else. And they want to pay the person $11 an hour. <laughs> yeah, I, I see that all the time. They, they want 15 years experience. You have to have a CISSP, right. top secret or secret clearance, starting wage, eleven twenty five an hour. Yeah, yeah, I see that one. Um, and they have, they have a home network router and a Xerox printer. <laughs> a, 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 a length of, a length of uh, job descriptions, like three paragraphs long, and what they're really yeah. looking for is a cyber technician to work in a, in a sock, installing firewalls and switching out motherboards, right? But, right. but I, I really want to address number one, bullet point one, relating to apprenticeships. Okay. So we've already we already know that anything in the tech fields have a hands-on component. So we are not talking about education programs anymore. We are talking about ways of various ways of workforce training. So you've done well in school, you've done well in your classes, you're, you're, you're graduating, there's no more school to go to, right? Can't go to graduate school anymore. You gotta get a job at some point. And so the apprenticeship model actually onboards a, a employee at 60% of the journey person's wage in a particular occupation. So for many of the cyber analysts and some of those types of positions we're talking about, they have a starting wage of about $50 an hour or about $100,000 a year. So that, that, that's starting, mind you, $50 an hour. That's, that's, that's you getting the foot in the door. So the apprenticeships would be set at about 60% of, just call it, it's like 5106, we'll call it $50 because we're not math majors that about $30 an hour is what you would pay an apprentice when they got on with the company. And they would have a 2000 hour or one year equivalency of work experience. And they can be flexible. Like if they were still a student, they could work part time over the school year and full time over the summer or just, or just do like 11 straight months of work. I mean, wh whatever the details are. And they are making 30 bucks an hour 40 hours a week at full-time rate. And I ask faculty when I'm talking to them, how many would take a $30 an hour part-time job? And every hand in the room, including mine, is up. So, so this, th these are solid occupations. I, I don't know if you could support a family, a big family, and an expensive part of the country, and you know, live high on the hog. But $30 an hour starting wage is, you know, that's going to be able to pay the bills in most parts of the country, uh, the world. And in any case, you have a 2,000 hour OJT. And then, of course, you are off to the races. So you have your degree or certificate because apprenticeships can be linked to any kind of education program, anything over a 155 hours, it's about four courses, I believe. After about four academic courses, a student could get into an apprenticeship track, two-year degree, four-year degree, whatever, doesn't really matter there. Hybrid students, I like that. Yes, there are hybrid students, those that are working part-time and those that are going to school full-time. I'm a, I'm a professor. The average student today in 2020 is taking 80, 18 units and working about 28 hours a week. So yeah, that's a pretty high. That's that, that that's a tough that's a tough lift right there for the uh, typical student of whom they are graduating about forty thousand dollars in student debt, which is a fairly significant amount of money. They're going to need this workforce development and these opportunities to be able to pay that kind of money. And that was sumo. You bet that 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 is a tough lift. I don't. Um, fall 2020 is obviously a different semester, so I don't know what it, you know, it, it might change right now because of the COVID-19 thing, but but before, in early spring of 2020, that was 18 and 28, respectively. Easy numbers to remember.
<laughs> You're killing me, Sumo. <laughs> we are wanting people to encourage the field. We we want to encourage and support folks into the field. We we understand the limitations and the challenges. And I think that's one of the things that we can do on the front end to let candidates know these kinds of things early in the process so that when we get folks into the profession, they they stay in the profession and that they knew what they were going to get. We we manage expectations as as students and as workers all along the process. And um, and I think that's that. You know, one interesting thing I'm, I'm talking, I see Vic and, and those comments coming up. One of the interesting things I think with that lift, there are plenty of folks that actually don't think that 2000 hour or one year apprenticeship workforce is enough, especially in a variety of the more specialized uh, technical fields. And um, for our friends in Europe, I think 2000 hour OJT would be, would be considered woefully inadequate I'm sure that most of them are thinking between four years of increasing levels of responsibility or they, you know, join the workforce as actual folks. Uh, I see the slide. Um, uh, it's I, pretty much a overview again. Yes, I'm, I was just responding to Shiloh. So the difference between an apprenticeship and a lengthier commitment of time is a internship and internships typically are very temporary in nature and can be as few as, I don't know, maybe, I've seen about 120 hour internships all the way up to, um, well, hundreds of hours internships. I think in, in, in some of the health fields, for example, they rely, and in education, for example, yeah. they rely on like 400 to 600 hours of, uh, of uh, in essence, internship experience. Um, and, and Sumo brings up a good point that, you know, uh, apprenticeships are more c culturally acceptable in some nations than they are in others. And they'll, they'll have to find some way to um, counter that or adjust for it. But at least in the USA, it's something that uh, has a long history. I, I'm locked and loaded on that question right there when yeah. when I, I get that I get the the initial reservation for the apprenticeship model and key limitation is finding employers to support the students right and apprenticeship right. needs a link to a employer and a specific job and so What's happening, I believe, and this is, this is Keith Clement's uh, opinion here. I do pre presume this to be recorded. Um, it is my view that as the return of investment or ROI of apprenticeship workforce opportunities become more and more viable and attractive to employers that are losing their competitive advantage due to significant workforce capabilities and skill gaps, they are they are seeing what other employers in the space and ecosystem are doing, and they are relying on what we would consider alternative workforce training models, of which internships and apprenticeships would be both considered examples of. The third also viable workforce strategy I hear a lot for or from coming out of industry is incumbent based workforce training where they already have somebody at the company doing stuff, but they want to bring them. They want to upskill them, reskill them, or begin to skill them up into IT and cybersecurity because, for example, they might have plenty of folks in the factory or too many people in accounting or that that HR is just too many and they, they they move them around they move them into IT and they move them into security specifically so 
of the IT sector, about one eighth of all jobs are currently found in the security component, and that number is going up significantly every year. And I would not be surprised if that number goes up a percentage or two a year. Significant growth is obviously what I'm talking about. And that's empirical. I don't have the numbers in front of me, but one could easily find those numbers as I have in the past. Yeah, and uh, we have contract ed in California, and they supply a lot of education opportunities for um, current workers to upskill, and many uh, corporations actually get a tax break on that. But uh, one of the things that kind of was hinted at in the chat was that a lot of the companies are constantly headhunting, and the problem with that, and many of them are starting to moan about it, is the fact that in order to get somebody with the skills you need who's working at another company to come to your company, you have to offer them more. And it's great for the employee. They actually get to cycle up and, you know, become more and more affluent, but it's just hell on the country, on the companies themselves. Because um, they're reaching a what, point where they can't afford it. So, you know, I, I hear a lot of things from industry, and one concern is that they don't really want to pay the education costs of their potential employees, and they don't really want to pay the workforce costs of on-the-job training either. But I think that the company has come to the conclusion they're going to have to pay for it one way or the other. So do they dump their money into the education side, right, solid skill-based programs that are linked to their needs as employers, or – are they going to go, and that's a little bit more altruistic, right? Because, right. you know, you're, you're dumping money in a first and second grade and up education, and you, there's no guarantee that those first and second graders in 20 years are going to be working for your company. So they've taken, I think, a less altruistic route, at least in that sense. And what they are instead doing is they have agreed to settle on the, the, the payment of wages, salaries, and related to onboarding of um, apprentice or uh, apprentice-like candidates, whether they're interns or like in engineering, they do a lot of co-op stuff, for example, right. and that they are willing to onboard increasingly these alternate workforce development models like apprenticeship. I think that it's important that um, to develop a apprenticeship center at the state level you need to work with the government and you need to work with the private employers and also educational institutions. And this is bolstered by the education clearinghouse that we already spoke about a bit ago. And I think that what I find to be most interesting is this idea of a roadmap. And we spoke about this earlier in the context of a career guidance counselor and having students drop by their office that might not be familiar with how to get IT jobs and cyber jobs. And the guidance counselor might not have the direct information either. No. Instead, they pull up these education workforce development maps that lay it out step by step, step by step, step by step. Right. Well, thank you for uh, joining us, Keith. This has been a lot of fun. Uh, we could go on for hours and hours. We kind of reached the end of our hour here. Um, I'll be happy to hang around and discuss even more. But uh, obviously, it's a lot more complex and uh, a lot of moving parts than people realize. But uh, getting these courses into the schools and getting these pathways developed is something that's absolutely necessary. And I really commend you on the work you've done. You've been a rock star and pretty much held the uh, task force together, keeping us focused on getting these uh, things developed. And I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate everybody's time today, this morning.